always, uh, I am planning many events for the fall and next spring. If you have ideas of other people that you would like to see, contracts that you need to explain to you, anything that we can help you with, please feel free to email me. My email is on the back of the program that you have. I also left some space for notes, so uh, all of the wisdom that comes from these three, you can write it all down yeah. and then we'll all, we'll all have a happy American Musical Theater. Uh, let me remind you please to turn off your cell phones, uh, and also no pictures or anything during the event. We are on the internet, so uh, if we could keep it down to a dull roar in the house until the question and answer, which will be at the end, we'll do all of them at the end, I'll come up and run that. If you have a question, raise your hand. I'm going to ask you to stand up to make sure not only we can hear you, but it's on the audio tape and on the internet feed. So without any further ado, I am so pleased to introduce Brian Yorkey, Tom Pitt, and Bobby Lopez. Enjoy, everybody. Wow, there's no, uh, there's no segue here. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's how, that's how we like to work. No Conversation just spring, arises organically out of situations like this all the time. Exactly. Um, well, this is great because we don't get a chance to be in the same room no. that, that often, so we, we just like to catch up. So maybe we'll just catch up about other things for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh, some of you may, may know or may not know, we, we all met in the BMI Musical Theater Workshop. Uh, we were in the same class, and uh, some other people that were in that class, uh, Jeff Jeff Marks. Uh, Marks and Amanda Green, Amanda Green, Curtis Moore and Tom Miser. So mm -hmm. it was a, it was a tremendous. Write those group. names down if you haven't heard them before. Miser and Moore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll hear them soon. Oh yeah. Um, and um, it was uh, it was pretty apparent, certainly, for for me, hearing uh, you know, Brian and I were working together, and um, it was such a thrill to discover um, Bobby's material. Mm -hmm. what, what was the What was the first thing that you brought in? Because you were you were you were solo, right? You were writing lyrics. I, yeah, I, I came in. They came in as a team, and um, and I came in um, just as a composer lyricist. And I, the first thing they did was the happy goodbye, right? The sad hello or happy goodbye. Sad hello or happy goodbye. Yeah, right. And it was a. I think the exercise was to write a thirty-two bar A-A-B-A, song. Right? A -A -B -A, yeah. Um, the first year at BMI is all assignments. <coughs> Everyone's given sort of basically the same assignment. Right. Um, Which is uh, actually really fun. I thought, I thought that was the, I loved that year because it was, it, I got a lot out of seeing what everybody brought to the same project as opposed to when everyone goes off and works on their own shows. Yeah, and I, I, I didn't love my first year just because I wasn't, I didn't feel I was part of the class until I started writing with Jeff. Right. Um, I just, socially, I didn't really hook in. I didn't get that there was a you know, big, like, social fun thing going on. I kind of I Wait, was, there was a social thing going on? <laughs> well, I guess you guys were, we were sort the of uh, orbiting planets, too. Um, no, but yeah, we'd go, we'd go out after, uh, after class every, every week to Cancun, the, the Mexican oh, restaurant, right. remember? Which still exists, right? Which is still there. Yeah, still yeah. there. But BMI has moved now. BMI, BMI has moved. They yeah. moved down to Fresh. World Trade Center. Yeah. yeah, that'd be a schlep. Yes. No, we don't go to Cancun anymore. <laughs> are you? Are we, are we taking notes? Is the wisdom yes. pouring forth? Um, I remember the first year being. I'm embarrassed to admit this, but on the internet. But I remember just being competitive. Yes. I think like that's how, how I, I knew you were good is every time you'd present, I'd be like, really? <laughs> oh yeah. I, I remember you and not, you I and remember. Tom and you and Tom and Curtis. You know anything? Anything you guys would do, I would just sit back there and scribble in my notebook. You're remembering it wrong because I know I didn't get very good in the second year. I, I, the first song I brought in was okay, and then the, um, and then I kind of got. We did the Blanche song next. We had to do in BMI first year. We do uh, the second song you have to write is this song for Blanche Dubois on her mad scene in Streetcar Named Desire, and um, it's just a suicide mission. Like you're set up to fail. Yeah. I mean, some people somehow write good songs, but I'm not sure they would really work in the show. But they turn out to be good songs. But I was, you know, you try and write something that'll work. But you know, like it's too like you don't write to Streetcar Named Desire. You don't, it's not a music. Yeah, we wrote a song for Streetcar Named Desire. We also, at the end of the year, we wrote one for Death of a Salesman. Yeah, yes. remember that Death of a Salesman? Because that needs to be a musical. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I didn't finish my Blanche song. I wrote half a Blanche song. It was some kind of habanera, um, which didn't really make sense for New Orleans. I got halfway through it and I was like, I didn't finish it. And they were like, Bobby. 
You have to finish your song. <laughs> <laughs> have you finished it yet? No. I, I will it's not like the PhD. That's right, because I think ours was like 10 minutes long, so we made up for everything that you didn't get finished. We were so excited, and then, and then we really got raked over the coals with our song, I remember, a little bit. We were, we were really upset. Don't you, you, you blocked it out, but I remember being blocked. really disappointed. <laughs> it's blocked. What, what, did, did you write in college? I did. I, At I, Yale? I wrote a little bit. Um, <laughs> I've been writing since I was little. I don't know about you. Um, I've been writing uh, music since I was like a. I was in. A, I was 11, and I started writing um, songs for my little drama group. And I got to write like a basically a show a year. They weren't any good, but they were like. I got to do it every year, and I got to feel like I was that. And then at Yale, I started writing show, shows, but they wouldn't do them. <laughs> Why? I don't, they just. I would kind of pitch them, and they'd be like, "Well, let's do a workshop." And I got like all these workshops. Which, um, <laughs> I thought, geez, if I can't even get a show up at Yale, well, how am I gonna, uh, how am I gonna do in the real world? But and how did you get together with Jeff? That was through BMI. But I mean, what what was the? Because because at BMI, you're also if you're if you're oh, not right. attached to anybody, you get to um, experiment and, and work with different people week to week, and then you hope something sticks. And you guys stuck pretty quickly. Yeah, um, we were. Um, well, I wasn't scheduled to work with anyone, um, and I I was feeling very competitive and also very paranoid that like I'm, I know I'm good but that I'm not getting the feedback I want because they also they um, make they a cut at the end of first year they do yeah they make they that. make a cut yeah, yeah. they yeah they they say not everybody gets into something right. yeah. no yes. I do remember that and yeah that <laughs> that looms very large over you once you realize like oh they cut two people um, if you don't know that going into it <laughs> you know what I mean everybody go down um no so I um but, uh, yeah, so Jeff, I, I was... Um, you were both composer lyricists, weren't you? No, he Jeff was, was a lyricist. Oh, so he's just a lyricist? And then his main collaborator, the guy he was supposed to write his 10-minute show with, um, dropped out of the program. So he was kind of left on his own and ended up... And so he needed a partner for the end of the year. And, um, and, you, have to, and you have to tell them what your 10-minute musical was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was, a, it was, a, um, it was called um, Hansel and Gretel in Disneyland. And it was something about, it was like about these two little kids, these two kids that ran away from home to go live at Disneyland forever. And um, they ran into Mickey Mouse, who in our version, who our, our satirical version was this sort of, was sort of the Walt Disney, <coughs> the, the, the anti-Semitic, cryogenically frozen <laughs> Walt Disney personality. Um, uh, <laughs> And he had this machine. It was like it was a little bit like Little Shop of Horrors. He had a machine um, that was basically this box with knobs and, and antennae and um, th this cord that attached itself to a little Mouseketeer hat that um, that the, he put on the kids to like suck their uh, innocence and soul so he could stay young. Um, <laughs> and it ended, it ended with a song called "Don't Give Disney Your Brain," which was probably the best song we wrote that year. I remember thinking ours will not be the weirdest. This year. But tell them what yours was. It was feeling electric. It was about a woman who gets shock therapy, which was later, uh, much much later, much much later. Yeah, won the Pulitzer Prize. It was very very. <laughs> it was it was very very different. It was very different. Very different. It was yeah. different from what it became. Yeah. yeah. BMI was, uh, I, felt, I felt like it was an up and down experience. Yeah. You know, all the way around. I mean, I think it was a brilliant experience for me. Well, it's hard when you get negative feedback on something that could work. And, and it's hard for anyone who's sensitive to take negative feedback and know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, I also found that, I don't know if you felt this way, but sometimes in a workshop environment, the music doesn't necessarily get the attention that the, that the lyrics do. Um, so I found myself at times just just starving for someone to say something about the music. Although I thought Skip Cannon was no, no. Then it would brilliant. come back to it would yeah. come back to our teachers who would be right, 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 would be wonderful. Yes. But in terms of the around the room, yeah, feedback. the workshop critique tended to be all about the words for the most part. But yeah. Skip, our first year, Skip was was brilliant with music. He could sometimes sit down at a piano and fix your song for you in fifteen seconds. I don't or know if Yeston could do that as well. More than that as well. Amazing. For, yeah. <laughs> um, and then yeah. Richard Enquist, your second year, was also was brilliant. He was a brilliant person, lyricist. Yeah. 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 But he, uh, but um, uh, that's the actually. I mean, that's the case in theater criticism. Like you don't, you never hear much about the music. You certainly, the music doesn't get as much attention. What well, was interesting because in, I, I, I remember uh, was it Anthony Tomasini who wrote an article about about the play scores mm -hmm. a summer ago? It was two summers ago? Yeah, um, yeah. It was interesting, sort of seeing your music reviewed by a music reviewer. Right. It was like, oh, well, that's I learned things I didn't know. 
about Tom's music because I think that so often people who who critique theater don't. That's that's the thing they know least about. Well, I, th I think that it's a, it's a gray area, and with with music, it's really a visceral response. You either like it or you don't. And and there are moments where I feel like if people don't like it, they go to a place of. Um, I've heard this before, you know, words like generic are used It all sounds lot. the same, it's forgettable. It's not hummable, yeah. you know, you, you hear a lot of that stuff. And, and, and for me, there's a, there's a real detailed uh, reaction, and, and, and I could go on about why, I, why something. And, and it, again, it's visceral, and a melody either resonates with you or not. But it's nice when people actually talk about it and why in, in, in an educated way, especially when you're in a workshop. I also think that everyone writes words. I mean, we compose words every day all of us do so we all sort of feel that we Everyone have feels they're an expert on that latitude to critique how words are put together and most of us know that we couldn't actually put very many notes together if we tried certainly not on paper so it's where it's a little bit harder for but that I think it's why in a lot of ways the lyric the, the, the iPad everyone can right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's such an underrated skill to be a lyricist it, it's something that I think oh. people feel like they can they That's can do the because they understand rhyme or and there, there's such a skill to it that because um, I, I write lyrics um, I've, I have a, I've, I had a band that I would write pop songs for, but I, I, I would never want to write show lyrics because um, I'm working with someone like Brian, and Brian's just so skilled and, and, and brilliant at it. I think the part of musical theater, music writing, that you can really help someone with, because you can't, in the end, you can't give someone the gift of melody or give someone the gift of being able to put their feeling into a song. Um, but what you can do is, like, for example, there would always be a song uh, every week that would start with a vamp, like a a rhythmic vamp or or boom chick boom chick boom chick boom chick and um, the song would kind of go on and go on and go on and um, for a song like that very often the, the key the key thing was and it's a very easy trick uh, was okay don't play what you wrote at the beginning of that sing the verse but sing it at a time and pianist you just play whole notes um, and, but play it up the octave and, and that would be a way to get into the song that started the character from a place of discovery uh, as opposed to, this is just a song and it's starting up right now. Um, Here's the next song. Instead of like, this is just a song and it's starting up right now. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought BMI, I mean, that's true for lyrics too. I think BMI was very good with that, with that craft stuff. Like, I think every week, certainly in the first three years, every week I learned something that I didn't know before oh, yeah. that I still use. You know, because I think that that's, I don't know, I mean, I feel, I feel a little bit like, being the one non-composer here, I feel a little bit like, like l writing lyrics is the smallest of the three arts, just because I think it's so, it's, it's a craft more than an art. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I think there are lyricists whose lyrics achieve the levels of art, but I think that for the most part it's craft. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's like building a cabinet like you know what you need to do, you know, mm -hmm. to me. Well, I think that, I mean, it depends on who's coming up with the idea for the song and the placement. Totally, and yeah, that's absolutely. And I think that, I mean, I think you guys, you guys elevate that to an, to an art form. Um, and we I, don't ever actually come up for a place for the song. We just write like a hundred songs <laughs> and then keep the ones that are good. <laughs> and then you have a show. I, I think the, the other great thing about something like BMI, though, is, is especially for, for me, who was pretty much out of school, was, was creating a kind of deadline um, atmosphere and and to take more ownership over the songs that you were creating the fact that they that they really made us write down mm -hmm. a piano vocal you couldn't just write I mean I think lead oh, sheets were okay I but, didn't do that. <laughs> but I remember I remember slaving you know at the, the writing writing the songs down it was something that because in, in in college when Brian and I wrote Brian would give me a lyric sheet and I would just write little notes on top of the words and, and then I would just play it my uh, that's why no one else could ever play it <laughs> so I would never write it down so that was a but I, I think we're, we're all uh, lear learning the skill of, 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 of writing to deadline, of creating something. Uh, writing when you don't want to write. Yeah, exactly. That's the most, yeah. But I also, I also think that, you know, listening to criticism. Yes. I mean, I was a sort of, you know, uh, those, th those years of BMI certainly helped prepare for, Definitely. you know, even writing, you know, with, the, with the, whatever team you're collaborating with on a show, it's like you have to... Everyone has to tell you the truth. If you're not telling each other the truth, then you're not going to get there. And Absolutely. Communication. The truth can be painful sometimes. So. The reason I started collaborating with someone is that I was, um, I was interning for Ira Weitzman um, at Playwrights Horizons, and I was telling him, I was trying to make him listen to my tape, and he said, you're in BMI, right? I said, yeah. He said, well, your stuff sounds very Sondheim-ish. You know, it seems like you're trying to be Sondheim. 
um, because that's what a lot of people were doing back then. Um, and, still uh, today. And still today. <laughs> some. <laughs> um, so he said, you know, just find, why don't you try collaborating? Like, so in, being in the theater is about working with other people. Even if you end up doing book music lyrics, you're going to have to work with directors. You're going to have to work with designers and producers. And if you really want this for a career, you have to learn how to do that. So that's why I, I reached out to Jeff um, and, and learned to write. And that was, for me, that was the hugest thing. Not just learning to write with Jeff and learning how to be with people, but um, talking, having an audience there every week to be able to connect with that audience and realizing that it's not about showing off your stuff. It's not about... Um, you know, how good am I? It's about connecting with people. It doesn't matter who those people are, it's just connecting with that audience. And that's, um, that's what Jeff and I, um, you know, enjoyed about our, about our experience at BMI was just like cracking up the class. That was, that was yeah. the fun part about it. And you also, I, you, you learn, I think, a little bit not to be precious as well. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? There, my, one of my favorite, Richard Enquist, who, who unfortunately passed away recently, was, was, uh, a real hero of mine in that class, and he, he and I used to sit in back together when he wasn't moderating. He'd sit in back and do the crossword, and sometimes people would get up and give literally 20-minute explanations about their song <laughs> before they sang the song. And it's like, you know what, in the show, you don't get to stand and explain it. Before, and he would sit in the back and doing his crossword and go, just play the fucking song. <laughs> and I just remembered, like, there was nothing, you know, you learn not to be precious. You're like, the song works or it doesn't. You know what I mean? And you, know, you may think you know how to improve it. Someone else may have a better idea, whatever. But in the moment, you put it out there, like you said, the people are there. It works or it doesn't work. And that's the bottom line. Well, if it takes 20 minutes to explain, the song moment might be somewhat. Well, because I remember also when we, when we did Next to Normal Off Broadway and people weren't totally getting what we were doing. You know, I said, well, I, you know, at first you're like, well, people aren't getting it. It's their fault. It's not my fault. Right, right, right. <laughs> but then you say, okay, well, we have two options. A, we can rewrite the show and have so that people get what we're trying to say. Or B, we can stand outside the theater every night and stop people on the way out and explain to them <laughs> what we were trying to do. And we realized that A was the more tenable of the two <laughs> The great thing about Second Stage is that there's a, a little, I guess you call it a mezzanine, along the side of the seats, everyone's sitting, and then you, there's a, so you can actually watch the audience reaction, <laughs> and there were a few They're moments. You're not creeped out by that at all? Well, it was creepy because there was one <laughs> moment in, 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 in Next to Normal at second stage where you could just sense that you lost them and this look on their face of uh, collectively <laughs> all around. So it was both helpful and terrifying to have that. Well, uh, what, what is it like for you, Bobby, writing now? Do you know what I mean? Like, oh. now that, A, you have to. Right. But also, B, you don't have to. Oh. I mean, you have to, but you don't have to. You know what I mean? Like, it's a job for, it's a job now. Yeah, you right. Know, which is a glorious place to find yourself. That's, that's, that's a good problem. Right? But it's, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. But it's a challenge, right? Well, it's a challenge because you do, um, you write, at first you write from an amateur love of writing, and it and also... from competition to be better than Bobby and Jeff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um... Uh, and no, I mean, but now it's, it's, um, there's still stuff, I mean, it has to come from inside you. I mean, I'm sure it's the same thing that, that happens with you guys, that, you know, there's, there's, there's some empty piece inside that still has something to say, that still is really hungry to, to connect in a, in another way. And, um, and it, and, you know, somehow when, in the, in the long drudgery of writing a show, you can't help but wish you were writing other shows, and those other shows become your next show. <laughs> um, Did you, do you ever phone it in? Have you ever phoned it in? Um, this I, is not I, going I tried. I, <laughs> after Avenue Q, we, we, um, Jeff and I had a, um, had a bunch of um, you know, projects that we were trying to do, and they seemed like good ideas at the time. Uh, and I think in the end we just didn't connect with them, or we didn't both connect with them, so that... Um, we were sort of trying to write, trying to do it. But in the end, I think what had to happen was we had to kind of um, break up as a collaboration because it just it wasn't find, working anymore. You know, go and find, go in your own way. Go and find, yeah. Things you really cared about. Find. How about you, Tom? You ever phone it in? No, I, I, I always not thought, gonna phone it in tonight. Especially when I'm writing with you, Brian. I would never phone. Uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just don't bring up the bit about the kid. No, I, 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 I was just thinking that the that the thing that I still can't get used to or can't can't quite fathom is is I feel like I bring this the same desire to every piece of music that I write, and then 
you know, people sometimes put them in terms of children. Some of your, you know, songs are like, I've heard Billy Joel talk about that. And there are some of them that I just look back and think, where did that come from? And why didn't I not know at the time that it didn't work? I just, it, it, you know, but, the, but, I, but going back to when I was at the piano, it felt very natural and exciting. So that's the thing. It's just why does one song suddenly become this, this staple of your show and then another song um, doesn't age very well and, and, and sometimes just gets cast off pretty quickly? That's, that's the fr most frustrating. That's where the children metaphor sort of breaks down. <laughs> Killing yes. the babies. Yeah. <laughs> yes, some you true. keep forever, some you sort of... <laughs> <laughs> we don't speak of her, I guess. The ugly ones, you kind of forget they ever existed. <laughs> well, it doesn't exactly break down. It becomes far-fetched, maybe. But don't you find that having kids um, kind of spurs you on to use your time a little bit better? Um, well, I have no choice. <laughs> um, like uh, I'm, I'm working on a, a, an orchestration um, for, a, for a symphony orchestra, and um, I just know that last night I'm going to be up till three in the morning, starting at starting my work at around ten after the kids are asleep, and so it's that world. And it's not every day. I mean, there are days that I get to go. Uh, I, uh, Brian and I have taken an office space, which has changed my life because it's really a place that I can go. I think everyone needs a, needs a place that they can go. But but it's it's just. It's very it's it's interesting to to think about a life where you were just kind of coming and going. If you feel like writing, you write. I mean, it's, you, I have to really be productive at a certain time, um, and that's a little bit more pressure. But <clears throat> what do you do when um, when it doesn't come? What do you how do you when, you, when you're I don't want to use the D mm -hmm. word, but when you when it's when it's not <laughs> happening, what do you do? Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> You're asking such good questions, and we're asking. I like, know. I'm asking the tough questions. Um, Freak out. Well, I actually read not to throw it back on you, but I read something that you were talking about uh -huh. that Trey and Matt do, uh -huh. which is called the Tuesday Draft. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that what it's called? Yes, actually. You know, it's funny because Jeff and I used to be um, horribly uh, critical and hard and editorial as we wrote. We would write. We'd write a line, we'd go, yeah, and then Jeff would go, like, oh, but that's it's not quite right, is it? And we'd have to, like, rewrite the line, and then we'd write another line, and we'd have to rewrite the first line again, and we'd just, like, edit each <laughs> other to death. Um, and we'd end up with good stuff um, for a while, and, and it, was, it was really working. That, I think by the end of Avenue Q, it was very, we had evolved this process that was extremely fraught with, uh, with, with hitting each other over the head with, with, with criticism. Um, and when, when I started working with Matt and Trey, they, they have um, had a, this process with South Park that um, every week they do an episode and it goes from, from Tuesday, from, they start on Thursday because that South Park airs Wednesday and then the next day they start, meet again, come up with an idea, start writing it, writing it, um, and then by Tuesday is their last day. So their, their ethic is don't... Um, don't edit anything. Don't just let the garden grow. Just let all the ideas come out, mm. um, and don't say no. Nah, it won't work. Um, no one gets to say no uh, until Tuesday, and uh, by then they kind of have the episode they want. But they polish, polish, polish. That's when their perfectionism. They call it perfectionism Tuesdays. Um, and so I. Yeah, that's a, that's like that's not one of the one of those notes that you can just take and do. Like mm -hmm. you have to practice that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like really a, worth a, practicing, though, is this sort of idea that we're just going to get something out yeah. and get something down. And got, I mean, we just, Tom and I just did a reading of our new show, and there were just a ton of what we call dummy lyrics, which are, you know, when you just put something in there so that the composer can write a tune. And it was very painful sitting in a room of 50 people hearing those things sung, but it was good because it's like, oh, look, the world didn't end. You <laughs> that's know? great. But, that's, I, yeah, but I mean, tell the funny story about the script, about the yellow, the, the highlight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I, in my document on my computer, I highlighted all the dummy lyrics in yellow so that I would remember to go, if I had time, I would go back and fix them. And I did not have time to go back and fix them. And some of them made, like, literally made no sense at all. Like, I'll lead you in a lead of silver water and shit like that. Because um, you just put something in that's the right rhythm, right? You guys know this. And uh, so I highlighted them all in yellow. Uh, and then it turned out that printed and copied. So everyone had, had yellow. Their scripts had, had yellow. Yellow. Well, the yellow. The yellow printed and it, and it copied like <laughs> so. All the worst lyrics were highlighted. 
people were like, is this, what does this mean? These are the important ones. And I just sort of, you know, wow. I was pretty toasted, so I was like, well, no, but that's great. What are you I mean, gonna do? That's what you want the audience to know. I mean, did you explain to them like those are just the ones I'm gonna change? Yeah, I did. I did. That's I did great. explain to them. You know, I did try that. That's awesome. <laughs> It, it, it did preempt a little bit of criticism. They're always yeah. having their core. I hate that one. Well, you saw that. I explained it to the cast, and you saw them all go, oh. <laughs> One of them, um, when Brian and I uh, first met, we met in uh, Columbia University, and we, we wrote the Varsity Show together, which is a book, uh, book musical, got this wonderful history, and um, um, we were put together as a team, and then Brian wasn't sure he was, he was going to be able to do it. So I was going to take a crack. This is, by the way, when I learned that I shouldn't be writing show lyrics. So I created the first song, and I brought it in and taught, to, taught it to everybody. And then Brian was able to work it with the schedule. So he came back, rewrote those lyrics, and people were coming up to being like, <laughs> being like oh, we get it now. You know, as if, as if it, I, I was just, I knew I was a stopgap. And, and, and all of my lyrics were dummy. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, just something to get us going while we waited for Brian. <laughs> Inside I was like, oh. God, that's humiliating. <laughs> but you did keep one joke, which is good. Out of, out of, uh, out of all of the better ones. Well, I'm always like stealing songs from your band and songs that you've written, and someone will be like, and I'll leave a few, I'll leave some of the lines in when you rewrite it for the show, and someone will be like, that's the most brilliant lyric, and I'm like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tom's, but thanks. <laughs> There was a, there was one um, one day of, we were doing a workshop of Book of Mormon and um, the scripts were passed out and there we were doing the read through on the first day and um, uh, <laughs> there was this one scene where um, turn the page and it was said Elder Cunningham right in the middle of the scene is like Elder Cunningham here I am typing some shit just to look like I'm working. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, when you're in workshop, you don't always have time for that last edit. <laughs> so what are, are, you must be, Bobby, doing a lot of um, film now and TV and, I mean, of course, the stuff that you've, already, well, that you've yeah, done the last couple of years. Um, the, um, the Winnie the Pooh mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, Kristen, my wife and I did uh, the songs for Disney Animation's Winnie the Pooh, which came out last summer. Um, and if you don't have young kids, you probably didn't notice. And even if you do, you probably didn't notice because it wasn't a big movie. But um, it was like an hour long. It's beautiful. It was very cute. It's a beautiful movie. Um, I we bought really the songs enjoyed. on iTunes. Oh, thank you. Oh, and <laughs> we actually have a little, um, a little lyrical homage to Next Normal in there. Tigger sings. We had this. Um, <laughs> this wow, song. I Tigger, Tigger, Tigger would be the them. character. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, there's, um, there's, there's a, a duet between Tigger and Eeyore, um, which is they've never done before, and why not? Because we've got Tigger is manic and Eeyore is depressive, and, <laughs> like, perfect. and, um, and so we wrote a song called, uh, it's, it, you know, he's, he, Tigger is trying to Tiggerize Eeyore um, and get him to bounce. Uh, so, um, so it's called "It's Gonna Be Great." Uh, <laughs> your favorite song? Excellent. Yes, <laughs> I tried for years to get that song cut from Next to Normal. Really? Yeah. Who was stopping you? Everybody. <laughs> I love that song. It's one of the stupidest songs ever written in the history of musical. Sorry, I mean the music is great. No. <laughs> You're not telling me anything I haven't heard you say before. Yeah, it's true. Um, it all worked out fine in the end. And so, so, and 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 both of you, because because uh, while Brian and I. Uh, you yeah, also what have, are you guys doing? You also have film work on, on your own. Um, do you guys find that, um, like, what are the major challenges and differences oh, yeah, between film and... I wanted to ask you and... guys, like, um, we're doing, Chris and I are now doing, we're doing a, an animated musical, the next Disney Princess one, and we're doing a live action comedy for Disney as well. Um, and I was, I mean, I'm very curious about the process of creating a live action, original story, original musical... <coughs> done as a movie for the first time it's hell it's hell right what what is the what, there is no are there any um historical precedents for it besides the bjork one well newsies right i mean newsies was a movie first yes, that's right that's right so um i mean there's definitely precedent once once, once yeah i guess i mean once is once is an interesting case because the, in the movie it's all diegetic music like it's right. all people actually performing music so it's not you know newsboys right. south park so, but that's not, not live action. Not live action. Oh, live action. Live because action. animated. The thing about animation is that it's um, is that it's very akin to the theater in that they're always doing these storyboards, which are rough, um, very easy to to uh, to draft pictures in comic book form that you can then 
turn into a little rough animated movie like by flashing these. It's like a slideshow almost. Um, and by doing that, you put temp dialogue in, temp, you know, put your song demos in, and you can very quickly get up you a know, rough draft. your workshop, basically. Sure. It's, yeah, it's the same thing as doing a workshop. You see it. You see it on its feet. But well, we with do, a live action movie, how do you do that? Well, I'm working, I'm working on, a, we're working on one right now for, for, uh, for Robert Downey Jr. And um, we've also, there's also another one that, that I've been working on for years and years. And in all those cases, we did things much like, um, much like we do in theater. Like Tom and I are writing songs for, they're doing a movie version of Sweet Valley High um, that Diablo so cool. Cody is writing. And uh, Universal decided, Mark Platt and Universal decided, you know what, this should be a musical. And they called us, and you know, they said Diablo Cody, and we were like, yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We don't know what it is, yes. Um, so we wrote some songs for it, and uh, we is that the one with Robert Downey? Jr.? Is he going to be in? No, this is a different one. This is a, no, he's not. But wouldn't Robert Downey Jr. in <laughs> Sweet Valley High be something else? <laughs> Dark Professor, new teacher yeah, comes exactly. to town <laughs> with a secret. Um, so we, you know, with that one, we did a Tom and I. Uh, we did a reading out in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just like just like you do here. And the funny thing is, you sort of do these readings, and everyone's like, "This is amazing." It's like it's really not amazing. We do them every week in New York, but you should come visit us sometime because it's really <laughs> it's great. So it's you know the the process of sort of workshopping. And I think ultimately, I think we'll probably do the same thing with the Downey movie. We're we're currently sort of in the middle of the second draft of the script. So you're workshopping everything you're doing. Two week workshops and that kind of thing. I think that's what I think ultimately we'll do that, or at the very least, a, a very least a reading with you know everyone learning the music and right. you know we had a cast like what thirty for the 25, 30 people Something for like the that. Sweet Valley yeah. reading and uh, you know I just don't know any other way to do it. No, I don't know any other way either. But it seems like I, I was, I've just been working on this one. We have it's not greenlit yet, so we're not we've not kind of got it into that stage yet. But it just the script development is very strange. Like how do you get to the draft that greenlights the film when you can't do the workshops, you know, it's challenging. It's weird. Yeah, it's really. Ch I mean, I think certainly we're, you know, with the with the movie we're writing for for Team Downey, it's 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 been a challenge to figure out the role that the songs are going to play mm. because especially because the development structure in Hollywood is set up around a very specific for live action. I don't know anything about animation, but for live action. It's been it's set up around a very specific paradigm, which I'm sure we all sort of right. know, uh, and that paradigm is not the same as a musical paradigm. Hmm. You know what I mean? No. So it's, the the big thing I keep sort of having to put across, like, well, you know, you don't want to write it so the like I actually had someone say to me in the process of one of these musicals, I won't say who or which one, but someone said to me, well, you want to write it so the songs can just lift out. Right. And I was like. No, actually, it's kind of the opposite. You want to write it so the songs are the most important part. And they're like, well, but, but what if we have to change songs? Like, well, then you change songs, but, you know, it's like you're writing a musical. It's been in the process of education a little bit. I imagine that's less so at, at Disney, though. Well, with animation, they're all, they, you know, I think Disney animation re-influenced, re I mean, musical theater influenced Disney animation when Ellen Menken and Howard Ashman came aboard, but then it, their work turned around and re-influenced Broadway. So, I mean, I feel like they there's a lot of wisdom in the in the. I don't animation. know about you, but the, I mean, there those movies, those uh, you know, Ashford Mankin movies are a big part of why I write yeah, musicals. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. You know, certainly. It's, I mean, Little Mermaid uh, and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. I was like, I want to do that. Yeah, but I think the other interesting thing, especially when it comes to musicals on film, um, is is the glee effect, and I think the fact that. That show has been such a boon, mm -hmm. but it's also um, not necessarily helpful to when you want to write a book-driven musical because the songs feel very presentational and very fun, and, and that's why I think there's an attitude of, well, you can just substitute songs and they can lift out. And, and, and so in, in one instance, it's great because you get the conversation started, but in another, you don't. You, I, I know that, that that exists on a wonderful level that not but every musical... Is gonna is gonna exist on. I feel like true, true. Although I would say that we, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have sold our movie no, no, that, to Team um, Downey if it hadn't been for for. Glee. But that's what I'm saying. I'm saying it opens the door yeah. and gets a conversation. Well, the big started. thing the big thing it did because we there was this other uh, movie called Time After Time, which I've been working on for quite a few years that we that we set up years ago, actually in 2005. Um, and at the time, we had to convince executives that you could sing in movies. 
Because yeah. this was before High School Musical. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and we had to sort of convince them. The way we convinced them is we got, you know, 10 really good looking 22 year old singers and brought them into the room and had them sing. Nice. You know, which worked. You know, like, oh, well, I guess it does work. Um, but, but the, and the great thing about High School Musical and Glee is that they've sort of, Broken the live action yeah. barrier for they make it. They, I mean, it's 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 geniusly done. It's it's very marketable, um, and that, that comes from uh, Rob Marshall, obviously the the Chicago movie. Because basically, Chicago and and Nine, like all those all those movies, it seems like they they do all their musical shooting on a stage, basically right. on a on a specific. Uh, stage and it, it must be cheaper to film it that way without doing sets and you know lots of different. It's so interesting because I do think you still have to sort of find a. I mean, with the with the with the the movie that we're doing for Team Downey. I mean, our our general goal is to try to have most of the songs be in situations where characters might sing in real life. Right. It's mostly set at a theater camp, uh -huh. so there are many such situations. That's great. Um, which is helpful. I, I saw this amazing Disney, uh, it was in like a Disney lunch lecture uh, with Howard, Howard Ashman. Have you ever seen this? No. Um, it's amazing the way he taught, he, he, talking about this very problem of people resisting characters breaking into song in the movies, which, you know, um, when, especially when it's live action, he, he says that animation is, it's one of those things that allow you to believe right. that a character might break into song, and um, and that idea was part of what what uh, brought Avenue Q in, into existence. The idea that it's not a person, you just go with it. Um, but he also said that, I mean, the reason why um, there's so many source songs in Little Mermaid is because he was worried about that, about you know finding excuses like he made Sebastian the um, the court composer. Um, right, right. It didn't have to be. There's the plays pay the bass. And yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, they, the yeah. fluke is the Duke of Soul. The <laughs> fluke is the Duke of Soul. Um, I thought that the Muppet movie was pretty great. The, the, the Jason yeah, Segel movie. Would you oh, call yeah, that live yeah. action? or would you, uh, No. <laughs> I mean, yes, it is, but... Like, it's both, yeah. I guess. It also wasn't really a musical. It was sort of a, a movie with It was, with but they, they did have... They, they, they had, had like four. Character-driven <laughs> stuff. I, I've watched it a million times. My kids love it. Oh, yeah. I loved it too. I loved it too. Absolutely. <laughs> well, there's the film and TV cheap, portion. Cheap, cheap. <laughs> um, so what else? Oh, so um, so maybe we should maybe we should talk about our um, our working relationship. Yes, <laughs> yes. About about how you fired me. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> um. um well, d during um, <laughs> during the development of Avenue Q, Jeff and I um, uh, decided that we shouldn't just have puppets. We wanted to have puppets and people, and we w were wondering well, what sort of people should be in this neighborhood. You know, if Sesame Street had Gordon and Maria, like who would we want to uh, to to live with alongside our puppets? And we both kind of like agreed on uh, on Brian Yorkey, and we thought Brian Yorkey would be the guy who lived on the block. Um, <laughs> and uh, I remember you guys because you had worked on this before. I you, they had worked on this project called Kermit Prince of Denmark, <laughs> which is um, and they ultimately weren't able to get the rights to it, right? Or to, to yeah, do we, it or they, we pitched it, pitched it to Henson, and they um, um, uh, no one wants to see them up at sing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> and because anyway, um, uh, and and so uh, Kermit, Prince of Denmark. The story was that Kermit's going on vacation to Denver, and he actually gets on a plane and goes to Denmark instead, <laughs> and he ends up in the Hamlet story. <laughs> Brilliant. And like Miss Piggy was Ophelia. And Gertrude. And Gertrude both, of course. Double, double, double. Uh, it was brilliant. But then after that came Avenue Q, and Bobby and Jeff came to me and said, you know, we're, would, could we make you a character in Avenue Q? And I thought they were going to make me a Muppet. You know, so I was like, yeah, absolutely. But then I found out I got to be like Bob McGrath. So yes. that was, it was brilliant. I actually did the first, like, two or three. Two or three or four. So oh, four like workshops. workshops, yeah. It actually, it always, I probably told you this, but it always been my dream to work with, with Muppets. And, you know, and, um, and Stephanie and Johnny and, the, and, the, and Rick, the people who did the original cast, were all Muppeteers. They're all people from, from Henson. And, and Brian was awesome. And, and. After we, we let him go, which was not our doing, we fought very hard to keep him on board. But Well, in um, fairness, they actually, it was a musical, so they needed someone who could sing. So, yes. <laughs> Brian kept offering to quit, and we kept making him stay. Um, and then the producers came and, and forced it. It was sort of an odd experience to sit there at the vineyard and w watch Brian make his first entrance. Well, in but we, we had tr a lot of trouble casting it and finding out like what that ca character was about. Um, 
And it was only when we got, I think, Jordan Gelber, we finally <coughs> put him in the shoes. He wore these, like, Converse, red Converse shoes that... Did um, you have red Converse shoes? I did, yeah. Converse. yeah. I actually did. I, we did one reading at the York, and I showed up... Because uh, the first reading we did, you guys were like, well, just wear what Brian would wear. So, like, I wore my... <laughs> Like I wore my, you know, orange shorts and my yeah. green shirt and my, you know, high tops and. You had the Seattle kind of. Um, yeah, I had the yeah. Seattle. It was the early '90s. Grunge was happening, or the <laughs> mid '90s. And then the next reading, I showed up in something else, and Jeff Marks was like, "Where are the shoes?" He's <laughs> like, "What?" He's like, "You gotta go." I'm like, I, "They're at home." He's like, "Well, well, can you go get them?" I'm like, at, "I guess at dinner." He's like, "You gotta get the shoes." So I, I took the note, and every time I'm thereafter, sorry. I wore the shoes. And then wasn't there the day? Was it Chelsea Studios that you walked in and you saw a bunch of Brian's in line waiting to audition? Well, yeah, we were we were we were doing we were doing Feeling Electric at Nymph at Chelsea Studios, and I'm walking down the hallway at Chelsea Studios, and there are like eight nice looking fat guys you know really like friendly fat guys in a row like really nervous i'm like this is i'm like walking along going that what's the, what's the and i get to the door that says avenue q auditions i was like oh <laughs> yeah it was it was it was uh, you know story i tell anytime i find out someone is an avenue q fan who might be able to help me out in some way <laughs> and how how's it going um at, is it um, New World stages, right? Yes. How's it going? I think it's going good. I um, I saw it um, a little while ago, and it was uh, it was in really good shape. How often do you how often do you see Q now? Probably not as often as I ought to, but probably you just as lie. often as I mean, you know, I, I, months go by, but but um, but it's in such good shape, and, and we have such good people taking care of it, um, and and very good actors, and kind of the whole set fits. Yeah. At least it looks like it does. Oh fantastic. yeah! Oh yeah! It was you it's know amazing. it was a set it's that was built for the space. Vineyard Theater, which originally was, right. Yeah, and that that set moved in perfectly to the Golden. And, Anna Luisa's, um, right? Yeah, Anna Luisa's. Yeah, such a great set. Are there any other productions of it? Um, there are now. It's been released. Oh, it has so been it's, released. Um, it's it's all over the. Place. I was researching the, this movie, this Downer movie, which is set at a theater camp, and I was looking at pictures of. I think it was Stage Door Manor's production of Avenue Q. Avenue Q Jr. Avenue Q Jr. <laughs> Avenue G, as we called it. <laughs> now they, what a, uh, I've heard. Avenue G. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about a film adaptation. Here. Yeah. Is, that, is it still happening? We keep talking about that, but um, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think we're just going to just let it be what it is. Yeah. Um, but it would be nice. I mean, I, what we always wanted was for it to be a television show. Um, well, I remember I, the very remember. first reading we did, it was a pilot for a television right. show. <laughs> Because right. Kate, Kate Monster at the York Theater, at the, and Kate Monster sang Taylor the Latte Boy, which I think <laughs> is the best Taylor the Latte Boy, my favorite. Taylor Amazing, the Latte Boy. yeah. Her, yeah. her Taylor, the way she flipped her hair. I, I, I saw so great. Um, Kristen Chenoweth do it on the Rosie Show, and it was nothing compared to to Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, um, it was. <laughs> um, but uh, and the word of the day was irony. Irony, right? That was the best part. Because I got to come out the beginning and tell everyone that the word of the day was irony. Everybody say it with me. Everybody say it with me. Irony. Irony. Oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember those. There would just suddenly be you and Jeff in like a deli. Oh, yes. We're panned to the two of you guys. We did a, we did a little video that, that, had, um, that had me and Jeff in it, uh, and it was called, How Much Do the People in Your Neighborhood Make? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that. Right. That's right. <laughs> and yeah. some of that pieces of that stayed in the show, like the the one night stand. We tried to put it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And all that. But we tried to do that song in a couple of readings. Oh really? Live, didn't we? We uh, did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I missed. I missed most. Tear it up and throw yeah. it away. Yeah. Tear it up and throw it away. Most painful cut. It was about jury duty. It was a, a song. <laughs> but this is an official notice. Oh, why didn't you say so? An official notice. Tear it up and throw it away. <laughs> and that was one of the first songs you brought in, wasn't it? Yeah, that was like the second. Early on. Yeah, it was early. Uh, that because was the thing, though. They'd bring in these songs. They were just, everyone was a home run, and everything was, yeah, so, you know, you, 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 it was so creative and imaginative. And, you know, it's, it's just. That was one, those were the electric sort of moments of that workshop. When, yeah. you, like, when you guys would bring in those songs, you'd be like, oh, okay. Oh right, you're like yeah. oh that could work on it. Oh, you know it was suddenly it was like oh that's what that's supposed to be. Yeah. Oh, you know we get it now. Yeah, we would um, <laughs> when we got our first actual job, which was writing for theater works. We thought we were you know we thought we had such you know we were such hot uh, hot shots from BMI. We were, we went we told Barbara Pasternak, um, okay so we you know we work so hard on these songs. We really kind of get them right the first time. Um, oh wow! <laughs> so, you know, I don't. You know, you'll find that we won't need to rewrite a whole lot. <laughs> 
How old were you? And she was like, uh huh, uh, 24, 25, <laughs> something like that. Um, and she was like, uh huh. And then we brought in our first song for Ferdinand the Bull, um, and it was called um, Stupido. <laughs> Which uh, I didn't even know. This means it basically, it, it's like much worse than stupid. It's, it's like fucking asshole in Spanish. <laughs> I didn't even know that at the time. I didn't even know that. <laughs> that would be for Ferdinand the Bull Senior. <laughs> Ferdinand the Robert Downey version. Yeah, exactly. Robert Downey Jr. in Ferdinand the Bull. <laughs> How do you top that? <laughs> well, so what, what do you I mean, I think that's the you know that's the thing that I think though that I mean, I, I think I was like that because certainly when Tom and I were writing varsity shows, we just you know we pulled the shit out, we stuck it up there, we gave it to people, they sang it, we did it, it was over, you know. And I think that that's the that's the learning curve for me from you know, I've gotten marginally better at writing songs. I've gotten much, much better at rewriting songs. Yeah. You know, and recognizing that, you know, because when you're the, you know, you know, when you're like 18 in your bedroom and you're like, I love you so, don't let right. me go. <laughs> you're like, this is perfect, poetic. You know, and then you're like, yeah, well, we're going to change that moment so he's actually now going to be a priest. And you're like, oh, uh, all right, I'll just rewrite the whole song where he talks about being a baker. That's cool. I'll just go <laughs> do that. But we, you know, we had songs, I mean, starting with Next to Normal, we had songs where the whole sort of purpose and meaning of the song changed, but the actual sort of hook and sense of it ended up being very important, yeah. you know? They always say, um, I mean, the, the, the general wisdom is, you know, you write uh, the, the, the book, you come up with the outline, and you write the songs to fit the outline. When the outline changes, you have to fit the songs, you have to write new songs. Um, and, uh, and it's just not so, is it? It's very much like... Uh, in a lot of cases, the songs are the reason you're doing it, and you're kind of fitting the book around that. So well, I'm doing this thing with uh, with Sting, you know, and it's like, really, I'm going to tell you what to write? You're Sting. <laughs> <laughs> you write what you write, and I'll make the book work around it. You know, and it's, it's, it's actually been a great give and take, but certainly, you know, if the great song comes in, and it's true with, with the stuff we do together, too, when, when the great song comes in that wasn't planned, you're like, all right, let's figure out how to use this, yeah. which is not how they, I, I think that's not what they say in, that's not the textbooks, but, no. you know, it's like, I don't remember who said this. I think it might have been Skip. He used to always say, it's not called a bookicle. Right. I imagine, I imagine that you did that for Next to Normal because those songs are so good. You, couldn't, you can't cut I'm Alive. You can't, you can't, you know, I mean, I guess there would be no reason to ever cut that one, but um, Superboy and the Invisible, I mean, like, those songs, those songs would be the reason. We did a lot of moving it. them around and figuring out where they went right. and how they would accomplish what they would accomplish and then rewriting you know, rewriting lyrics. I think the greatest, one of the greatest lessons I learned on Next Normal was going from, you can't cut that, to, okay, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. what, what is the problem? Right. You know, because, because and, and you see it, um, there, there, are, there are writers who just, they put their foot down and they say, I'm not going to rewrite that, or I think that song works. And like, like you said yeah, many you times, can't. you know, the audience doesn't <laughs> lie. And if something is not working in your show, you have to be big about it and be willing to really look at it. And it may be painful and there are, there are great songs that um, you know, songs I'm proud of that aren't uh, aren't in shows, but yeah. but I, I think you have to be willing to look at it. It's tr it's true. I mean, it's like, and, and believe me, when someone told me this, you know, 15 years ago, I would just not. I wasn't hearing it, but it works or it doesn't work. The audience doesn't lie, you know. By the time you get it in front of the audience, you want to change it. If it doesn't you'll work. know. You want to change it, and you keep going it until it works. And yes. the other thing that David Stone always said with Next to Normal, and we were. We gave David and Michael Greif and Carol Rothman some kinds of hell, I'm sure, because there were things we wouldn't cut for the longest time that we ended up cutting, and that's a big part of what made it work. But David would always tell us, you know, the audience doesn't know what's not there. Right. Yeah. You know, which, yeah. which you know, it took me a while to learn that lesson, but it's like, it's like you will miss it, you know, and then eventually you'll get over it. You know, and there's still only... Phantom there's, limb. There's, yeah, there's one little phantom limb for me in Next to Normal, and that's it, you know, out of... 50 some songs <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing like watching a good cut work I mean it's yeah. the greatest feeling rather than rather than trying so hard to yeah when, to when we cut something. that Costco song 
you know, we'd written this song where she yeah, has, her, I remember she has her first nervous breakdown. We're like, well, the, she has a breakdown. We can't get rid of the breakdown. And Michael right. Reif would be like, you might find a way. <laughs> and for weeks, we'd be like, no, we can't get rid of it. There's no other way. And Michael would be like, he might find a way. <laughs> and then we had a meeting with him. He's like, well, let's talk about some ways. And so we like, we like, all right, well, we'll try it. And then the first day we did it, we were like, oh. <laughs> And Michael was like, yeah, we found a way. Isn't it funny? They always seem to be in that spot in the show. It's like, right, like the third or fourth song in, um, you need to get to the story in Act One, but you have this song that you always wanted to write. For Avenue Q, it was uh, Tear It Up and Throw It Away. For your guys' show, it was Costco. And for, and for Mormon, it was, there was a song called Family Home Evening um, that was about um, Elder Price's family, uh, kind of you know, the, this tradition that is in Mormon uh, households where they all have, they all, no one can turn on the TV. They have to spend, hold hands and, and um, drink, uh, you know, drink caffeine free soda and, <laughs> uh, and play board games and read scripture. Um, and it was this great little song and, and it just didn't, uh, and it was, it was like the only song with Mormon jokes in it in the whole show because um, most of them are about Africa and about the characters. But there was like the one, the one song we put in there for kind of general interest about Mormons. Had to come out. The song you want to write, the song you kind of write the show for, is always. How long of the out. process did it? Uh, did you cut it? Like was the it the last? Previous? The last workshop. No, it never got to oh, rehearsal got to. for Broadway. It was. Uh, it was. It was cut. In well, for us, that was probably also feeling electric. Yeah. Which was the number at the end of the uh, first act because the song that was in it from the from the from the beginning. Show, yeah, it was from the te- yeah, it was from the from the very first, and that the show well, was Yang. called that for the yeah. Well, Yang, Yang, oh, yeah. rocking it out. Um, and we it, we had that off Broadway. That was the moment Tom was talking about. We would go, it was the last number of the first act, and you could go watch the audience. And they were at this point sort of like this, like this, and she like went off to get her, her treatment, and then you know, feeling electric happened, and the doctor ripped off his scrubs and became a heavy metal <laughs> god, you know, like they do. And, um, <laughs> and you could see the whole audience go. Oh, god. <laughs> and that was the end of the first act, and they'd be all like. <laughs> you know, and that's, sort of, that's finally why we were like, yeah, maybe we should, maybe we should change that. I only ha- ever had um, sort of a, um, a passing familiarity with feeling electric because for some reason we were always scheduled right before you guys, and um, <clears throat> we'd come in and, and we'd, you know, we'd do our big presentation, and then we'd, you know, they'd be clapping and we'd be outside going, <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> all through your show. <laughs> We had to follow you guys at the end of the second year, I think, didn't we? Or at some point. End of the first year and end of the second, second year. End of the second year. It sucked. Yeah. <laughs> were there a lot of songs in Mormon that you guys... There were a couple. There were, there were all... The, actually, you know, we, were, we would always be... We wrote a lot of our songs in the beginning of the process, and then towards the end, a lot of the songs that we ended up cutting were these, like, abortions. They were terrible songs. Like, there were a lot of songs in Mormon that... That you know, you always hear about these songs that you loved and, and cut because they didn't fit the show or made it too long or the wrong, you know, not didn't fit the moment. But like a lot of the songs we cut for Mormon were just bad. <laughs> they were cut because they were not our best work. <laughs> there was a song we just did it at a um, um, at a little uh, party for the Drama Guild actually, and uh, it was called um, the Get Along Song, um, and it was happened really late in the show, um, in the scene where Elder Price is drinking coffee. And Elder Cunningham comes in and says, what's, what's happened to you? Um, and it was this very catty song about, like, if you say something arrogant, I'll just smile. Well, if you say something stupid, I'll back you up. Or, you know, it was, it was like that. And if you start talking about hobbits when the conversation has nothing to do with hobbits, I'll just say, oh, wow, hobbits, how cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it had, this, it had the generic vamp of, Bum 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 bum, and if you, I think you just stop when you start playing that vamp. You just cut the song. Then you'll save yourself. So all three of you collaborated on lyrics. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was um, it was yeah, it was it was like that. And was it sort of shifting? Like someone would bring in something, and everyone would work on it, or how did that work? Um, we would kind of hash it around. We'd talk it over. We'd come up with all the jokes together. And then one person would synthesize it into lyrics, and then we'd all edit it, and that's how it would. It, and that, that's the part that would kind of shift around. But, um, but yeah, it was it, we'd we'd sit there and, and discuss and plan out everything in the song. Was it hard for you coming into that like long established collaboration? It was it was it was weird at first, I guess, because it was like because they're like every once in a while you. Do they have all like, sorts of inside jokes and shorthand, and they're really good. They're such good like communicators and. 
they're good at collaborating because they always work with other people. Yeah, they have to manage the staff on yeah, the show, right? They, and it's really just a couple of, you know, it's a few other people in the room with them. It was a lot like what we did. Right. Um, and they made me f feel really, you know, down, you know, really at ease. So it was, it was great. great. They're, they're, they're good at that. Um, but uh, but every once in a while, I would freak myself out. And I'd be like, I can't work with them. But I love what they do. And I don't know. You know, they wrote Uncle Fucker. <laughs> well, I am right. And now are you guys talking about an, an, a new show? Um, yeah, I think maybe. We'll see. I mean, we, have to, we, we haven't sat down and really done it yet because they've been off doing South Park. and, and uh, It's um, a lot of work just having a show running. I mean, you yeah. guys are going to have to cast some replacements, I'm sure. Yeah, we just, we just cast. Uh, I don't know if we've, fin we've completely cast, but we, have, we are having to look for replacements for Josh and Andrew because they're all going... To um, to work in television, going to Hollywood, and leaving us. So mm. it's very sad, but uh, but it's very exciting for them. And uh, and then we have to cast these tours and London too. So it's all it's all happening. It's, crazy. All it's all happening. That was a preview of Bring It On, which is coming to the same time. <laughs> Yay! We're so excited about Bring It On. I, I haven't seen it. I've been hearing about it. It involves like everybody I know. Um, Vaguely paranoid that they're all having fun, <laughs> you know, somewhere without. It is me. kind of it's the sort of the dream team. It is. Yeah. 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 Do you ever feel like, oh, that's everybody I know? Well, I came to I came to one of their previews in L.A. and I was like, oh, hey guys, how's it going? How's it going? It's like they're writing this high school musical and I'm all, can I sit over here with you? But luckily, Amanda Green is always very nice to me. Because yes. we were original, right? Amanda Green. Buddies. Amanda Green was Gary Coleman for us for, for time after time after time. I w I wish I'd seen her do it. She's hilarious. She was great. Um, it is, a, but all, it's actually also all very nice people too. Yeah. Amanda, Jeff, Lynn. Yes. Tom, Tom, but. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what is it? What is it like to win the Pulitzer? It was. <laughs> Still, it's 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 un unbelievable. Yeah, it's that's a it's it's I don't know it's it's well, it's all the things that you would say you know it's a tremendous honor it's it's one of those things that doesn't it doesn't really seem as connected as you know that's a bad thing to say but but you you know um, you win a Tony and you're like oh I used to watch these when I was six years old and you're like maybe someday I'll win a Tony right. I don't know what for but maybe <laughs> I can find something. Um, and uh, and that's an amazing experience. And a, a Pulitzer, it's a bit more sort of like, wait a minute, that's. I learned about this in school. Yeah, I learned about this in school. Like this is this, this is, is like this not is people for... that make history win these. And then you go to the luncheon, and there are all these journalists who like exposed corruption and saved a town from poison wells and things like that. And it's like well, we wrote a musical. And that's, <laughs> that's the and that's the thing that I remember the most is being at that luncheon, and because because when else would we be at at, at a sort of function? Where we'd be so outside of, of of the theatrical world and get to yeah. just be sitting with people like that, I found that really thrilling. Yeah, because yeah. I wanted to be a reporter growing up, so it was really cool, sort of meeting all of the, all of them, and and also sort of realizing, you know, I, I said this, and it, it always sounds like false modesty when you say this, but it's really not because everyone knows I'm not modest in any way. But um, <laughs> you know, the Tony felt like something that 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 was certainly tremendous fortune involved in, in everything. You know, um, the Tony feels very connected to the world of theater and what we do. The Pulitzer felt like, you know, it wasn't so much that Tom and I won it, but that the show in its moment in this world right now was recognized in that way. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm not being very articulate. Um, but, but it was um, more, in a way, it was more sort of David Stones and, and Barbara and Patrick and our producers who, who said, okay, we'll, we'll give this a shot, we'll bring this to the world, and we'll... Take well, a chance with it. Well, you guys were taking a chance too. <laughs> it's not easy. To... Yeah, but it wasn't our money. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it felt like it was. It was to a, have a big a commercial event. hit about about um, shock therapy and 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 um, bipolar disorder. That that is not heard of. Like that is something that everybody would give their left. Well, and the cool thing, about, I guess, the coolest <sighs> thing. I, I don't want to speak for you, but yeah. I think the coolest thing about the Pulitzer was that. It was a really, that show was, it's a cliche, but it was a labor of love for everybody. Nobody went into that show. David, Alice Ripley, Michael Greif. Right. No one went into that show going, well, this show's going to Broadway. It's going to be a big, big hit. 
Yeah. You know, it's going to recruit with investment and win a Pulitzer, I can tell. <laughs> Everyone went in going, this thing's really weird, but it's really compelling somehow, so let's see what we can do with it. Yeah. And that was the spirit everybody took. And so that having that spirit on everyone's part rewarded was really cool. We all, we all know the stories that have inspired us, and this had to happen, and this had to happen, and it's had a long history, and somehow it made it through. And, and, and I think we all romantically hope that we can be on one of those shows, that we can in some way contribute to something that feels like it has a moment in time and against, against odds, and um, it's just something that, that, that you hope will, will spur on other people to take chances. And I, I think looking back at Next to Normal, you know, even besides something as, as gargantuan as the, the Pulitzer Prize, but just the fact that I think people can look to it and say, uh, like you're talking about David and Barbara, that people took a chance on something, they believed in something, they saw it through, and, 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 and we hope it will inspire other people to take, to take chances, and, and, and that's then you the best thing. look at the little Pulitzer plaque, and you're like, we will never write a show that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, um, I was having lunch, Chris and I were having lunch with Maury Yeston, and he said, well, and those guys, they just made us all look bad. <laughs> <laughs> I love Maury. I saw him, uh, I saw him, I think at MTC a, a couple months after the Pulitzers. And I, and, and I, yeah, and, and he just, I saw him like, hey, Maury, how's it going? He's like, you did it! You did it! <laughs> I was like, that's, that felt like Broadway to me, having Maury Eston go, you did it! <laughs> have him take you to lunch. It's, it's, uh, it feels very much like being in show business. <laughs> <laughs> he is show business, he Maury Eston. Uh, Q&A? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Unless you have more, you know, cool. stories to This has been fantastic. This is great. Awkward. Yeah. I hope it hasn't I'll been tell you my next to normal story at some point. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, I have to compliment you. I think Nick Donald's one of the most brilliant musicals ever written, any time period and so forth. But what I want to know uh -oh. is what made you go for this particular subject. Was it something in your personal life? Was it something you thought of? Because it's moving because it's a very honest prediction of a bipolar woman. And the fact that the score is a mix of rock, Broadway, and all that, I have to compliment you, because I think it's the best score since hair, for my opinion, for, in terms of the rock stuff. So I'd like to know where it started from. Before you got to the vineyard, or wherever you did it, I would like to know how you got to the idea, how long it took you to write it, how you present it. I'm sorry, this may take 40 minutes to get down, <laughs> but I would like short to hear the story. I can tell you, well, I'll tell you a short version. There's two things. The first one, there's two where it comes from answers. The first one's a little bit embarrassing, which is we needed something for our 10-minute musical for our final year in BMI. And we wanted to do, we knew Bobby and Jeff were going to cook up something, and we knew Tom and Curtis were going to cook up something. So we knew, we knew we had to up our game a little bit. That's actually perfect. I don't know if you felt that way, but that's actually perfectly honest on my part. So competition was part of it. But uh, I was at home watching um, uh, Dateline NBC, and I saw a report on shock therapy, which I didn't know at the time was still practiced. And so I called up Tom and I said, uh, and I've told this story before, but I called up Tom and I said, how about a 10 minute musical about a woman who is bipolar and has you know, struggled with it all her life and has to go through shock therapy? And Tom said, all right. <laughs> and, you know, and, he's like, and he was like, I don't really get it, dude, but I'm sure that if you feel passionate about it, which is sort of like, that's how our relationship is. Like yep. one or the other of us will do something and if the other one doesn't quite get it, we'll go, I don't really get it, but let's go with it. Let's see what happens. And it goes both ways and uh, it's, been, it's worked out very well for us. Yeah. Um, and um, and then we were like, we thought that everyone would go, you can't do that, Bobby and Jeff are better, get the hell out, you're awful. Um, and there was a little bit of that, but but what we found is people would stop, even after we did the first seven musical, people stopped us to tell us a story from their life about someone in their life who struggled with mental illness or it had uh, ECT or, or had been institutionalized. And, and we realized that there were people in our lives and, and people close to us um, who, who had been touched by mental illness or bipolar uh, in, in some way. And we realized two things. One was that there was actually might be a show there. There might be a story worth telling. And two, that we better do a lot of research <laughs> to get it as right as we could. So um, that's where it came from. And it sort of, and every point along the way we thought would be the end of the line, and every point along the way someone you know, literally after we do readings, people would come up to us and tell us stories. They seemed almost compelled to tell us, to tell us their story. And that, I think, told us that it was worth working on even if, you know. People would also come up to us and go, it's just brilliant. I don't know who the hell the audience is, but it's great. Good luck they to you, say kids. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I don't really, thanks for coming. You're the audience, aren't you? Um, and uh, um, from that first 10-minute musical, Tom and I worked on it off and on for... 
seven, six or seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and we would go away and do other things because we were both trying to get careers started. And Tom wrote a Broadway show, and I went out to, to L.A. to start writing screenplays because we wanted to find some way of making a living. But this material kept coming back, and people kept being interested in it. Um, and again, sort of really short version, a director by the name of Peter Askin um, got on board with it, and uh, we did it at the New York Musical Theater Festival with Peter, where a producer named David Stone uh, saw it. And David had recently produced this little thing called uh, Wicked, I think. Mm -hmm. it's about witches, I guess. I don't know. Apparently it did well. Um, and it left him a little money to spend on, on unlikely projects. Uh, and he, he took us under, our, under his wing and brought us to second stage where Carol Rothman and her staff you know, gave us this sort of off-Broadway birth, which was, I don't know, you know, those of you who followed reviews, the reviews were not great. They were mixed. They were the definition of mixed. I mean, there were some very good reviews, and there were some very, very awful reviews. And I think at the time, we sort of thought, well, that, I mean, I sort of thought, well, that's, that's that. That was, it was interesting, and now I'll go back to writing screenplays, because clearly my career's over. Um, and David Stone said, no, 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 let's keep working on this. And he, he helped us uh, hook us up with the arena stage, and he you know, took took us down to Washington D.C. and we kept working on it and, and brought it back to Broadway. How much different is the show from Second Stage to Broadway? What were the changes basically you made? Was it just tone or cuts or? It was all of that. Um, certainly, there's a lot of material that's consistent between the two productions. But the things that we lost and the things that we added, I think, make a world of difference in the tone. We lost things like feeling electric in Costco, which we talked about, which were pulling the audience out of the story. Um, the, the end of Act One had a, had, a, had a new, softer ending, which just, it's, it's all about, uh, you know, following the story and staying in, in, in the proper tone with the piece. And, and I think we were losing people. Um, so we just really were clear about the story we wanted to tell. Um, but, but again, the, you, would, you would recognize a lot of the material from Second well, Stage. Well, it's funny because Broadway people would come up just and say, well, we saw it at Second Stage. It's a whole new show. And it's like, well, it's actually not a whole new show. I would say probably, you know, we, you know, a half dozen songs were swapped out for other songs, two songs were cut and two songs were added. You know, this is a show with about 35 songs in it, so, so it's, it's not, it wasn't a huge difference, but every difference made a difference, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> uh, one is, uh, what inspires you and how do you answer that unanswered question, which was, what do you do when you don't feel like writing and you're not inspired? What, what gets you going? And the second one is, in the early, early days, how did you find producers? And what kinds of presentations did you make? Um, so, uh, so well, the first question, I, I think what inspires me is um, <clears throat> I was looking for, for new ways to use music in storytelling and new um, those, the moment when you break into song has to be a surprise. And um, what, what excites me is the idea of writing songs that people haven't heard. It's not necessarily music that people hasn't, haven't heard before, because I'm not sure if that's even really possible. But you, in the theater, it is possible to give people experiences they've never had before. And that's, that's what excites me about, about, about writing. Um, and uh, as far as um, you know, uh, how to write when you're not into it, it's good to have a routine. It's good to be writing every day so you aren't, you know, when you, when you stop for long periods of time, that's quite often, we, we did it recently, we were working on um, this Disney movie and um, the whole thing kind of got um, shaken up in a big way. We had written these two songs that we loved and the whole, the whole story got um, shifted around and, and uh, the characters changed and our big opening number didn't work anymore and our and our other song didn't work anymore. We had to throw it all out, and we hadn't been writing for a while. And then we were looking at this like, well, the next thing we write is going to be worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we haven't even written in 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 a, in a month and a half. So, you know, that's when it's really hard. And then, you know, it's just a matter of forcing yourself to do it. And, you know, I think it's a therapy kind of thing. It's it's more of a um, quieting, learning to identify those voices in your head. I mean, just listen to the song. Um, Die, vampire, die. Like that'll do it. <laughs> you hear those voices in your head. You learn to recognize those voices as not you and not real. You can, you are, and you don't write from your from your dark side. You write from your connection to the universe. You know, it's 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 your talent doesn't go away, ever. It's always there. It's just you you getting in your own way with these thoughts. So I think it's all about, it's all therapy stuff. It's all 
learning to identify those voices, pointing, like calling them out, <laughs> and you know, die vampire, die. That's for me. That's what that's about. You guys. Um, well, I'll take on the producer question because oh, I think yeah. that I think that you actually nailed the first question. Yeah. I actually was like, oh, that's really good. <laughs> um, I think that's all really true. Um, you know, I think that the, the producer thing is is a very very hard one. You know, the the thing that I think is I learned was helpful to keep in mind about producers is that they're all human beings and they respond to material or they don't. And if they don't respond to your material, it's no reflection on you. It's no reflection on them. You respond to something or you don't, um, and and that's um, I think always helpful to keep in mind. The second thing is um, I think that you know it's always helpful to do a reading of some sort, even if it's just getting your actor friends together or inviting whoever you know who might know someone. Um, uh, it's very very hard, especially if you're writing musicals. But I think plays too are very very hard to judge on the page. Even people who are at very high levels, I think. I bet even Andre Bishop would tell you it's hard to judge a musical on the page, or Ira Weitzman. Oh, you, you know, can't, yeah. You know, so, so if you can put together a reading um, uh, and, and get it seen, and that's number three. Well, how do you get it seen? Well, it's, it's hard, you know. I mean, certainly, you, I think, entry into something like the New York Musical Theater Festival or The Fringe or... I don't. I guess they're not doing SPF anymore. Oh no, yeah. NAMP, which is too bad. So NAMP, NAMP, entrance into NAMP. I think entrance into any of those festivals is very, very helpful um, because they help you with publicity and many logistical things. But I think you can also do your own reading and invite people. And I would say um, on that subject, don't you know? Tom and I spent many. I mean, Tom was a little bit more connected than I was, so actually, you should be answering this question. Um, but but I think that you know, don't expect. David Stone and Jeffrey Seller and Margot Lyon at your first reading. But maybe you can get David Stone's assistant and Margot Lyon's associate producer. And do you know what I mean? So the other thing to do is just be, sounds really basic and stupid, but be friendly with everyone you come across and get to know who they are and what they're into. Do you know what I mean? Because I certainly know that, um, uh, for instance, uh, in our case, Second Stage, the associate artistic director, Chris Burney, saw the show before the artistic director Carol Rothman did, and Chris went to Carol and said, I think you should come see this, I really do. And she came, and so she agreed to co-produce it with David, blah, blah, blah. That's how those things happen. And so even if you know, the person who you're showing it to or the person you know isn't necessarily a person of influence, they might very well have the ear of someone who does. Mm -hmm. So I think those are, those are the big pieces of advice. And the other one is persistence. I had just two other things about the producers. One. One is, um, I, you know, I'm a I'm a shy person by nature, and um, and um, and I don't like to go out and meet a lot of people and network. Um, and I think just instinctually, I gravitated towards Jeff, who is the polar opposite of that. He's like, he, you know, he was nobody when we met, but he knew everybody somehow. I don't, and he would always say like, oh, from around about. <laughs> he just he and he had this friendliness and this and this magnetism um, that got Jeffrey Seller to our first reading. Um, so you know, if you have the, um, if you are in the position to pick a collaborator, and you're choosing between someone who has your same faults or someone who has, uh, who compliments your faults, pick the one that compliments them. And uh, the other thing, I uh, didn't do that on purpose with Tom. But it's the <laughs> same with us. <laughs> uh, I can't remember the other one. Um, Sorry, that's all right. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tweet it later. <laughs> My question is, whenever you're asked to critique either student work or the work of a young writer, uh, what are some of the most common pitfalls you see, uh, particularly in regards to the actual songwriting, and what advice do you offer to them slash us? <laughs> That's a great question. Hmm. Well, you know, every, everyone is so so specific in their writing, um, but I, I think that one thing that I that I will notice sometimes is is something that, especially in these kinds of environments that I think we were talking a little bit about, which is writing for the room as opposed to writing for the moment and being truthful. And I, I, you can tell sometimes that sometimes a, a moment will be filled with imagery and music that doesn't seem to match the moment. And so I, I, I sense that the writers are, are, are trying to expand themselves and, and create something that, that seems impressive and, and harkens to material that they are very influenced by, but it doesn't work as well for the moment, 
Um, so I just always try to encourage the writers to really be truthful. Don't overwrite it. Don't overthink it. Really, really take into account what you need to get across. Um, and, and, and sometimes simplicity is, is, is better. Um, and make sure that, uh, that it's a true song moment. Uh, because there are moments where there's a lot of dialogue or there's a lot of setup um, and it doesn't quite feel organic, it doesn't quite feel like you're getting the, the true moment um, across. Um, and in those instances, I just ask the writers to really investigate what they're writing and make sure that, that it truly wants to be a song moment. Maybe it's not the right song, maybe it's not the right moment. I'm going to give a real quick a couple pieces of conflicting advice. But one of the first one is, I think, what Ira said to you, which is find your own voice. Because I think so often I read and listen to young writers who want to be Stephen Sondheim, which, by the way, no one will ever be. You know, um, they want to be Michael John Lacusa, they want to be Jason Robert Brown, or Bobby Lopez, or Tom Kitt. And that, that, that not only are you never going to be those people, but, but be yourself. Mm -hmm. Find your own voice. Because that's the only thing you can be sure is unique. Because there are, I mean, there's already a Tom Kitt and a Bobby Lopez in the world. There's not a you. So find your own voice first and foremost. And then the flip side, which may sound like it's contradictory to that, but isn't, which is pay attention to craft. Because you said, I think, earlier, you can't give someone the gift of melody, but you can learn the craft. Mm -hmm. And you can learn the craft from a workshop like the BMI workshop from ASCAP. You can learn it in grad school. You can learn it by coming to things like this. You can learn it from reading books. I learned so much songwriting craft from reading Sondheim and Company. Yeah, Craig Zadis' book. Yeah. So much that about lyrics. Yeah. It's an amazing book. You can learn that craft. And so take care of the things you know you can take care of and put yourself in a position to let you know, your own voice sort of flow out of that. And please, sorry, please pay attention to your presentation. Pay attention to what theaters or festivals ask for and send them that. Don't send them something sort of like that. Make sure your <laughs> punctuation is correct, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of my second, uh, the second thing I was going to say, and it harkens back to something we were saying in, in the office before, um, that you have, to, you have to learn to be someone that people want to work with. Mm -hmm. um, you, can't, you can't be, um, you know, sort of giving people uh, this impression that, you know, that you think you're better than them or, you, you know, whatever. It's all this people person stuff that you need to, I mean, at least I kind of needed to learn it, and um, and but I did, and and I can do it's, it. It's hard to get your head out of your it ass is. when you're worried about your work and when right. you're trying to do a good job. But if you get into a festival or if a theater invites you to do a reading, or it, keep in mind that those people have a chance to invite you back, and they talk to everybody else. Every festival talks to every other festival. Every artistic director knows every other artistic director. And given a choice between a decent musical written by an asshole <laughs> and a decent re musical, or even a slightly less decent musical written by some really great people who are really great to have around and great collaborators, that one wins almost every time. The other thing is I think that there's a, I was saying this before, and I'm not sure if it's right, but I, it seems right to me that, that there's been a cultural shift in this country um, <clears throat> from... From, from a time in which being sarcastic and cutting was friendly and fun, um, and now it is super aggressive and awful. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think, you know, if you read Sondheim and Company, um, and Arthur Lawrence is like cutting Sondheim down, and Sondheim is cutting his friends down, and everyone's, you know, you get the, the impression, or if you read, you know, Norman Mailer and all those people, that, that that's, you, you know, and... and Societies of writers. Well, there's, a, there's a line in other desert. Isn't there a line in other desert cities? Stocker Channing's character has a line about bitchiness, doesn't she? Or bitchy it. sarcasm. It's a great line. I can't remember it, so I won't quote it. <laughs> it's a great line. Where but, she, she basically says it's passe. Right. Like you think it's so charming, and it's not. Right. It can be the most mean. I mean, if people take take it the wrong way, they don't know you're friendly. People take sarcasm as a as a real as a real attack. Um, I was a BMI a few years after you guys, um, and then I sat through the graduate musical theater writing program at NYU. And so we're at a point now where we're starting to think about agents and stuff. And I was wondering if you could all talk about your experience with how you got your agent. And well, there's only one agent now. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's, there's three, right? <laughs> three agents. So, yes, yes. There's the King of Broadway and everybody all else. Agent, yeah. We all have the same agent. Who is watching now? Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I, I first heard of, of John because uh, you and Jeff signed with him. Right. And um, I also heard his name from Kurt Deutsch, um, who runs Shikaboom, who, who I met pretty soon out of college. Um, and, you know, there's, it's, it's one of those things, so many, so many of the really life-changing 
moments in your career happen through circumstance and connections and you can't mm -hmm. really predict them. It's not like there's a, there's a real rhyme or reason to a lot of it. I know for me, for example, um, you know, I went about uh, uh, trying to work with John through the normal send my material to him. Um, and, and he liked it, but he didn't sign me from, from that. And it wasn't until High Fidelity when um, uh, you know, he saw our material out there, and I think Amanda had already been signed with him, um, that yeah, I remember being on the phone with him one day talking through High Fidelity stuff. He's like, you know, you should just come over here. And, and you know, he, we've, not only is he my agent, he's my great friend. And so you know, it, it was interesting the way that all happened. But, but for me, it was a combination, I think, of being visible, of having material that he actually could see and, and have a sense as to how he could manage uh, my career and what that career will start to look like. Um, and also just having connections and people fight for me and, and, and keep bringing myself up to him and having something like, like feeling electric out there in the world that people are talking about. So you just, I think you just have to attack it from every um, instance, you know, getting, getting, your, getting your material out there um, and, and just trying to network and, and don't take, you know, I mean, obviously don't be aggressive, but I think you just have to really, you have to, you have to I'm gonna, like I'm gonna, you said, persistence. I'm going to be a little bit of a cynic here just because my experience of getting agent was very different than Bobby and, and Tom's because there is the experience where the agent comes and sees your reading and is like, oh, my God, come and see me Monday morning and don't talk to anyone else. That does happen. It's very infrequent. <laughs> but for the most part, it, it's, it's true. I'm afraid it's as true on Broadway as it is in Hollywood. Agents will sign you when there's a deal pending. Yeah, that, that was our experience as well. Yeah, agents yeah. won't sign you before that. Agents will sign you when there's a deal pending. Because they're not, they're not there to get and, you work. They're not there to get you work. That's that's part B, exactly. And and please, I do not mean this to be discouraging in any way. This is just, you know, this is just being honest. They will sign you when there's a deal pending, when they can make money off of you, A. And B, they don't get you work. Even after you sign with them, they don't get you work. They can negotiate the deal once work comes your way. They can certainly suggest your name for things, but with very few exceptions, if the producer or the rights holder didn't call with your name in mind, the agent's not going to get you the job. They might get you a meeting, but they're not going to get you a job. So I would say keep that in mind, that they, they'll, they'll, they're, they're, they're not likely to sign you until there's something happening. And even after they sign you, and certainly before, finding work making things happen is not their job. Mm -hmm. That's your job. And certainly, again, like I said, doing those readings, having things that they can see, that's certainly helpful. And by all means, send things around, because it does happen that agents hear things and, and sign you, but it's, it's, it's relatively rare. And they're very, very busy people, and they're very, very good at what we do. I think all three of us would agree that we're incredibly blessed to have the agent that we have, because he's fiercely protective, and he, he's an amazing negotiator. Uh, and he's universally beloved. Everybody loves oh, him. Oh yes, um, he's, he's but, one of those nice guys. But he would e he would even I would even not be embarrassed to say this if he were in the room. It's not his job to get me work. Right. Do you know what I mean? That's that's my job. And we also got him when he was uh, when he was sort of young and up and coming too. So I mean, sometimes you know these people, these agents, think when they get big, their client rosters get full, and that's. Um, that's kind of the end of that for new clients. Yeah. But, um, but, uh, but there's well, always somebody up and coming. And again, it's, a, it's, up a, and coming. it's another thing. There's always someone up and coming. Again, it's one of those things where if you don't have an agent, you know, don't, don't, don't sort of buttonhole the Joe, Joe Machotas and, and George Lanes and John Bazzetti's at the party. Look for the junior agents who could use someone to buy them a drink. Yep. And because uh, uh, again, Scott Chow -offs. with the, yeah, the Scott Chaloffs, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. But actually, the, I, before, uh, John, I worked with Brett Adams for a little while, and, and Brett um, actually was feeling electric. You know, I didn't have anything. I ended up working on Debbie Does Dallas, so he actually did eventually have something for, to negotiate for me. But that was an instance where I really did feel like Brett saw something. The you. problem was, um, you know, that when it came time for, for High Fidelity and Amanda Green and I went in and talked with Brett, he didn't see it. And so it took a, a, a John Bazzetti who, who did, and, and, and things took off. So, you know, it's, it's... He didn't see how good it was, you mean? Or he didn't no, no, we didn't have any material. He just, oh. just didn't, uh, didn't, didn't, the, the, the wanting to pursue this and the rights, because that's what he had to do. He had to get right. the rights. Um, you know, it didn't really take off. That's the other thing is you want to make sure they're a match with you. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. I was just going to ask if, um, I've been working at this in a long time, I'm a book writer, a lyricist, but I'm also a producer. <coughs> have any of you had to wear both hats? Because I find it really frustrating. Music. Producing, you mean? Yeah. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I would love to leave that to the producers. <laughs> I don't have, I, I, it's enough to just, 
um, keep things afloat in, in my department. I just like to get producer credit. <laughs> I start to get people saying, would you produce my stuff? And suddenly my stuff gets put somewhere else. That's hard. And then yeah, no, I, 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 I worked at a theater out in Washington State for, oh. for seven years as associate artistic director, and I produced a lot of new musicals out there. And I ultimately had to leave that job because I was not, I had no time to, to write. If you're, if you're a writer, I mean, I would say, and that's the thing you love, and that's your, I would do that first. It's hard. I mean, you do have to learn how to self-produce. That's a different sort of thing. But getting sidetracked into producing other people's things, unless that's another joy for you, makes you just... The other thing is, like, is like find that... Fiercely protect that writing time. Mm. Is, that's, a, that's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, I think Jerry Mitchell said that uh, uh, writing a book uh, for a musical is relentless storytelling. And um, I've had a little experience at that theater in, in Washington. And uh, bringing a director in and, and getting that third point of view and actually moving the project toward production was completely a, a mind-blowing thing. And it occurred to me that getting a director in earlier on a project is, is a way to, way to really fast-track it in, in an accurate way, in an efficient way. Do you guys work with a director? When do you bring a director in? Uh, do you have a sense for where in your process you are when you do that? I, th I think it varies. It sort of depends on the project. But I know that um, for, the, for the projects I've worked on, it feels like the director has come on board at the right moment. When, um, and it's, it's nice, certainly, to have the director early um, to help with, with, with dramaturgy, and especially if it's a... Um, you know, Brian and I knew that that for this next show, um, that that Michael Greif was going to direct it, and and that he was the person. We had a vision, and 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 he, we 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 loved our next normal collaboration, and and love him, and so that was that was a no-brainer. But I'm sure there are some things that Brian and I will work on where 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 we still need to figure out what it is and start to you know talk. Yeah, about I mean, it. I think is I think it can be too early, but I do think that you know as soon as you have something that's beginning to take a shape that is going to be ultimately put on stage then it's worthwhile having a director because they're the people who know how things are put on stage. I mean, I know that that's, such, that's a simple way to put it, but like Jerry Mitchell, for instance, or, a, you know, or Michael Greif or a, you know, um, a Casey Nicholas, someone who is like, okay, great, here's what I'm getting from you guys. Is this what you're trying to tell me? No? Okay, how do we, how do we make that right? right? Also, okay, you, this is, here's some realities. Here's some physical realities for you to be aware of mm -hmm. in terms of how this is going to work. Also, here is what the audience is going to get. You say, well, no, that's not what we meant. Okay, but I think this is what the audience is going to get. It's actually my job to have a good sense of that, so let's work on that. All those things are hugely, hugely valuable. We actually had three directors in the history of, of Next to Normal on our long path, and each one of them was uh, helped revolutionize the show mm -hmm. in their way. Yeah, that's been my experience, too. I'm, I've been lucky to work with really good people from pretty early on in the process, but not before my idea of it wasn't manifest in some form, you know. There's always, there are always, you know, like five or six songs and an outline or a, a script or something. With Avenue Q, we had, a, we had a, a director friend that helped us put it up, and um, often director friends have to go, don't ever sign something that a director friend wants you to sign, because then it makes your project harder to produce. They, a director that's, needs to have some experience. Yeah, that's the other caveat is that, you know, um, the challenge is that is a lot of times you want to hook up with a director who is sort of where you are in your career, and sometimes that's not the person who can ultimately bring the thing as far as it wants to go. So that's, um, I think, that's a reality all three of us have faced at various times. But it, it's, it's, it's um, a symbiotic relationship, um, you know, just like... Uh, Girls and boys don't date the same age in high school, you know. Right. It's the same thing with writers and directors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely true. <laughs> okay, uh, last question. Hi, um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about writing music um, for theater and sort of balancing a lot of your stuff as some of the influences from pop rock and, and classic music theater, balancing those influences. And the second part is, um, I was a big fan of your band's album, and um, it, was, it was interesting hearing, I think it was I've been from the album, it was, in that context, and then it ended up, I guess, in the show and with, with different sets of lyrics. And sort of that process of, of taking, I guess, like a pop rock song into, into a music. Sure. Um, well, uh, you know, again, and, and, and it's, it, it was so great to hear what Brian was saying about, um, about his advice to writers, because I, I feel like that's the advice I, I try to live with 
is, is who am I as a writer? What kind of music do I want to create? Because, um, um, you know, I, I, I want to, and, and I don't mean this in, in a conceited way, but I want to be a fan of my music. I want to I wanna enjoy it and I want to listen to it. And I get great pleasure out of listening to a piece of music that I've written and say, wow, I'm really proud of that. That's something that I, I if I hadn't written it, I would be excited about. And that, that's the kind of music that I, that I try to create no matter what the style is. Um, and then when it when it comes to you know the the, the band into into uh, musical theater um, again I, I found that my voice has been consistent um, and the the material that I wrote for my band um, were melodic um, melodic pop songs um, based certainly in influences but you know it's funny Brian would would sometimes joke about the period that I would write some of these songs, you know, it's a 24-year-old searching for, because, <laughs> you know, making fun of the actual things that were going on in my life. Um, and, I, and I think that Brian was a big part of those songs, even though um, I wrote them myself at the time, because he was experiencing who I was and what was, what was bringing out those songs. Um, and I think some of the, because they were about, they were very personal songs, and Next Normal was a personal project, um, in a few instances, it wasn't so much of a leap to say, well, the hook of that actually lends itself um, to our story. And that was thrilling because, especially when I realized that um, how much I love working with Brian's lyrics, um, watching those songs, and, and two specific songs, I Am The One, and, um, and I've been seeing those songs suddenly reach a whole new level because of the storytelling that was going on in Next to Normal. Um, that, that was just thrilling. So, you know, I, I, I think that for, for both of us, I'm sure you're the same way, Bobby. You know, we, 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 we create things together and, and, and work together, but sometimes we'll steal. Brian will have something or I'll have something, and we'll go, we should, we should use that for... Um, so I think those songs were written to be theatrical, even though they were written as pop songs. They had a, they had a story and they had a melodic content that could lend itself well, and, and, and luckily it did. What do, what do you... Um, I'm not sure what was the question about about the your influences. <laughs> How do you balance your influences? Oh so? yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, no. I mean, I um, I always feel like I'm uh, like um, I'm working from a model of some sort. I like to work from models, um, but I also there's another part of me that knows that's not really what I do. That I'm writing something from from here, and um, I think that I don't think that I'd be able to have had success if I was just kind of ripping stuff off. I feel like there's something that comes out anyway, but I definitely start with a lot of, I look at other songs, I look at like every single song that, uh, that's like this that's been written. How can I bring in uh, something something that people know but haven't seen before in a certain way? And, um, and how can I surprise people with the kind of music that I'm using? It's almost like a film director would, you know, would think of using music, you know, to, to score a scene. Um, and I always feel like, you know, even the greats, even even the golden age of musicals, like a song like um, like I could have danced all night, um, that that song is is no different from a Cole Porter song, but it's the placement in the story when she's just you know she hasn't said I love you or anything like that. There's nothing spoken, but she's just so excited and she can't her head can't hit the pillow, um, and there's just something about that that charges that music with something completely other and that's what you're going for I think when you're writing a song you're going for that with that surprise and that the electricity that the situation and the characters give the music and the music doesn't have to be doesn't have to you don't have to go out of your way to to write something that someone hasn't heard before because the the true innovation lies in the mashup Thank you guys so much.